Welcome to this IAS USA webinar. Today is Thursday, March 31st, 2022. My name is Jose Francisco and I'm a project manager at IAS USA. We are excited to host part two of our two part CROI update. Part one provided highlights and clinical research and the on-demand version is now available on our website. Today's presentation, part two, will discuss highlights in HIV and COVID-19 epidemiology and prevention. I'd like to introduce today's moderator, Dr. Roy Gulick, Rochelle Belfer, Professor in Medicine and the Chief of Division of Infectious Disease in Wild Cornell Medicine. Welcome, Dr. Gulick. Thank you, Jose, and welcome to all of our attendees here today. As Jose reminded us, this is the second of a series of two webinars to really review the hottest and latest data from CROI. As we know, one of the most important HIV meetings of the year, and of course this year also including COVID-19. Neither Dr. Buckbinder, our presenter for today, nor I have any relevant financial affiliations to disclose. Just a reminder that the IAS USA is accredited to provide CME credits for this webinar. And uh, this activity has been designated for 1.25 AMA category one credits. And you will receive an email after the webinar to tell you how to get those credits. This activity also has been approved, as you can see, for ABIM mock points, nursing contact hours, pharmacotherapy credit, and pharmacy contact hours. And you can see the numbers of hours there. We appreciate the grant support from our platinum supporters, Gilead, Merck, and Vive, and our silver supporter, Janssen Therapeutics. The on-demand recording and slides from this webinar will be available within 24 hours after the broadcast today. And uh, you can see the website there or just log into the IAS USA website and follow the instructions. Today is an interactive session. We will be offering poll questions that will appear in a separate window. You can simply choose your answer and that will be registered. And then we'll let you know how the audience voted today. We're also, we've left sufficient time to entertain your questions. And the way to do this in Zoom is to use the Q&A button and put your question right in there. And we'll try to answer as many as we possibly can. The chat function is also open, but please use that to simply chat. If you have a question, go back to the Q&A button. So we have a poll question for practice. Do you currently prescribe PrEP? Yes, no, but I'm considering it. No, and I'm not interested in it. Or no, I'm not a prescriber. Please go ahead and vote. Okay, here are the results. 60% of you are not prescribers. Of those who are prescribers of the whole audience, the most popular choice was yes. And uh, then you can see some people are considering only one person in our audience today is not interested in PrEP. We wanna ask who that is. That brings us to um, my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Susan Buckbinder. She's director of the Bridge HIV program at the San Francisco Department of Public Health, as well as a clinical professor of medicine and epidemiology at the University of California, San Francisco. As well, Susan has served on the CROI organizing committee for uh, several years. And Susan, we are greatly looking forward to your presentation today. Thanks for joining. Thanks so much. And hopefully you can see my slides. So yeah. I'm gonna go through um, some HIV and COVID epidemiology and prevention. Um, these are the learning objectives. I won't read through them, but you'll be learning about both HIV and about COVID as well as HIV prevention methods. So I have uh, two questions. Uh, knowledge questions. We'll do the pretest question number one first. Uh, after Black and Latinx men, 
who is most at risk of becoming HIV infected in the United States? Is it white men, Asian men, native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander men, or black women? Go ahead and vote. Dr. Buckbinder, um, while we're here, if you could put your presentation in uh, presentation mode. Oh, it's not, you're not seeing it that way. No. Let me stop sharing and get it back. Perfect. Thank you. That did the trick. Uh, so we see uh, that the majority said black women, and I'll, I'll go over the answer to that question shortly. Um, let's go on to the next question. So which of the following statements about cab, uh, long acting cabotegravir is false? In the first year of unblinded data, it was still shown to be 66% more effective than TDFFTC at preventing HIV. There have been no cases of breakthrough infections in the participants who got injections on time. Some people with breakthrough infections developed INSTI resistance or RNA testing is recommended at baseline and every two months. Go ahead and vote. Okay, um, so we have a smattering of different uh, results here and we'll go through, uh, I will come to this and I will highlight for you what the, the false answer is. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with some HIV epidemiology and we'll start with that first knowledge question. Um, this is about the lifetime risk of an HIV diagnosis on the left-hand side or among males, on the right-hand side or among females. This is a risk um, one in N. So. A, a lower number is worse, uh, meaning uh, one in 20 would be worse than one in 200, for instance. Um, and the scales are different. So this one only goes up to 200, and whereas this one goes up to four, 1,400. So what you can see is that the risk is higher in men than it is in women. It's one in 76 versus one in 309. But the groups that are most at risk are black men first, then Hispanic men, and then after that, black women. So the majority of you got this answer right. Um, black women are actually at higher risk than any of these other racial or ethnic groups of men. And the, these are data from 2017 to 2019. What's not shown on this slide is that the risk rates improved somewhat from the 2010 to 2014 analysis that CDC had conducted. This is the geography of risk. And what you can see is that DC has the high, is the jurisdiction with the highest risk at one in 39. Wyoming is the state with the lowest risk and nine of the 10 states with the highest risk are in the, in the South. Um, and that the South accounts for over half of all of our infections in the United States. So that's where the epidemic is at its most intense. And then when in life, in the lifespan, do people become infected? Well, for men, the risk is highest in the 20-year uh, uh, age range, whereas for women, it's in the 30s um, that uh, they're at highest risk. Most of the risk actually accumulates by, by age of 50, but 85% um, of the lifetime risk has accumulated for men by age 50, but only 76% of the lifetime risk for women. So there's more risk that's happening in older ages in women. This now is some data on the life expectancy after an HIV diagnosis in the United States from 2008 to 2018. And what you'll see is that overall, there was a 4.2 year increase over that 10 year span of time. The men are on the left and the women are on the right, but if you go to the very right of the slide, I'm gonna give you the summary of um, what was found. There was a shorter life expectancy in people who had AIDS at the time of diagnosis. By race ethnicity, you'll notice for both men and women that Latinx had a longer life expectancy than black African-Americans who had a longer life expectancy than white uh, individuals. Um, and by transmission category, the longest life expectancy was in men who have sex with men, 
followed by women at heterosexual risk, followed by men who have sex with men who inject drugs, followed by women who inject drugs, followed by men who are at risk through heterosexual sex, and the lowest life expectancy is in men who uh, inject drugs. But it has actually improved in all categories. So this was some interesting data that really shows where we're missing opportunities for uh, HIV prevention and care. Um, and this was, there was an outbreak of HIV in 65 people who inject drugs in West Virginia. And what they did is they went back and looked in their health records and found that on average, they had had 3.2 healthcare encounters per person per year um, before their HIV diagnosis. In that time, 62 HIV screening tests were performed, but only 6% received syringe services. Only 31% were prescribed naloxone. 45% were prescribed medication for opioid use disorder, and none were prescribed PrEP. So again, it shows us where we're really missing the boat on uh, HIV prevention, as well as for treatment of, uh, of um, substance use uh, and giving people substance use services. So um, this was some data that I thought was very interesting, trying to look at what happens when people drop out of care. Can we get them relinked into care? So this was a study from CDC that was done in Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Philadelphia. And they took these correct clinics and said, if you had dropped out of, within the last 12 months, if you dropped out of care based on either not having a CD4 or viral load test in six months and or missing an appointment, or having no clinic visit for six months, then you were put into this pool of individuals. And so what they did is they generated lists from the health departments and from the collaborating clinics, came up with a list. Um, they had 1,893 individuals and they randomly assigned them um, to either get the active intervention, which was to have a disease intervention specialist, try to track them down and link, relink them to care or whatever the standard of care was for that clinic. And then they looked at, did they re-engage them in care, meaning just that they had one blood test, a viral load or a CD4 count within 90 days, where they retained in care, which meant they had two lab tests uh, more than three months apart within 12 months of randomization. Um, were they virally suppressed within 12 months of randomization? Did they have an RNA um, of less than 200 copies? And were they durably uh, virally suppressed? So they did improve re-engagement in care somewhat. It went from about 55% um, in the uh, group that, was, that had the intervention compared to 42% in the control condition. And they were, there were more people retained in care, 51% versus 46%. So that was a marginal improvement. But there were no improvements in viral suppression or what I'm showing on the right, which was durable viral suppression. So you can see what the levels of durable viral suppression were like, but there was no difference between the intervention and the standard of care arm. And so what we might draw from this um, study is that we might need to intervene more rapidly when people drop out of care, but also we probably need to address the reasons for dropout in the first place and perhaps create some different systems of care that make it easier for people to actually uh, access care. So these were data from a home-based survey in 12 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, population-based. Um, they accounted for 316,000 new annual infections. Um, that's what was estimated. And that uh, is really concerning that it's only in 12 countries, given that the UNAIDS target was half a million globally by 2020, and we missed that target. We actually had 1.5 million new infections in 2020. Um, the HIV incidence was twice as high in women, 3.8 per thousand person years, as it was in men, 1.9 per thousand person years. And what you can see is that women were at greatest risk in the 25 to 34 year age category and men at greatest risk in the 35 to 44 year age category. But women age 15 to 34 accounted for more than half of all HIV infections throughout these both of these populations um, age 15 to 60. That just shows that we need more uh, interventions, particularly for younger women. So let's turn to talking about HIV testing. There were a number of uh, studies on HIV testing. I just pulled out this one from Kaiser Permanente Southern California that serves 4.7 million 
uh, patients. And they evaluated chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, and HIV testing. In the gray bars and the, and the uh, scale on the left, you'll see um, the, HI, the testing rates. And on the right-hand side, what you'll see is the actual positivity rates. Um, so what you can see is that for all of these tests, there was this dramatic decline that we're looking from 2017 to 2020. And we had this plummeting in the number of tests of all kinds. Uh, around the second quarter of 2020 or uh, right when the COVID pandemic was hitting. Um, and what you see is that by the end of 2020, there was a rebound in the number of tests done, but not to pre-pandemic levels. And I'm gonna walk you through this slide. It's looking at what was the uh, total decrease in the number of tests that I'm showing you in black. So 24% reduction in HIV tests, 17% reduction in syphilis tests, 31% reduction in gonorrhea and chlamydia tests. And we saw a commensurate reduction in the number of HIV diagnoses, 26% and 29% in chlamydia, but only a 7% reduction in gonorrhea diagnoses and actually a 32% increase in syphilis diagnoses. And so what that suggests is that there's probably an underdiagnosis going on in HIV and chlamydia in particular due to reductions in testing. And so the authors concluded that the increased diagnosis rates of syphilis and only modest reductions in gonorrhea cases are concerning for widespread underdiagnosis of asymptomatic or clinically latent infections like HIV and chlamydia, rather than that there was a population level decline in sexual activity and that declines in HIV and STI testing limit the ability to curb forward transmission for asymptomatic infections. And that's particularly problematic if we want to end the HIV epidemic and the STI epidemic. So one of the ways to try to address uh, the issues with uh, testing is to do home testing. And so CDC started this direct to consumer HIV self-test distribution program where they wanted to distribute 100,000 self-HIV tests using this OraQuick uh, oral uh, fluid test kit. Um, and they wanted, they gave themselves 18 months to distribute the 100,000 uh, kits from September 2020 to February 2022. And people were actually able to order this online through this Take Me Home portal. Their priority audiences were Black and Latino gay men transgender women of all races and ethnicities and black women. And they used these national testing days, national transgender testing day, national, national HIV testing day, and national gay men's HIV AIDS awareness day as particular focal points for advertising. But they used all of these various media channels that are shown in stars um, here, superimposed on the 48 counties shown in the dots that account for more than half of new infections and the seven states um, that are part of the, HIV, the ending the HIV epidemic, um, counties and states. And here's what they were able to do. They actually delivered the 100,000 tests in just eight months. Um, and they delivered them in all 50 states, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. They reached populations that reported never testing for HIV, and that was 26% of all orders, or most recently testing over a year ago, that was 33% of all orders. So they did reach a, a good population of people who hadn't been uh, tested or not tested recently. Cisgender men who have sex with men placed nearly half of all of the orders, that was 47% of the orders, and 18% of them had never tested. That compares to the National HIV Behavioral Surveillance Studies that suggests that about 5% of men who have sex with men have never tested. And the marketing campaign encouraged participation by cisgender Black women who accounted for 11% of all orders, 22% of whom never tested, and transgender women, 1.6% of all orders, 24% of whom never tested. So it was a successful program. But um, we don't have data on linkage to care. And these are two studies that did have data on linkage to care on self-testing in India, where 24% of people living with HIV are unaware of their status. And the overall prevalence in the population of HIV is 0.2%. So we have this uh, Thacker abstract on the right and on the, on the left and on the, the Bell abstract on the right. Both of them studied multiple states within India. This was a seven month study. This was a 24 month study. 
There were virtual counselors uh, who reached out to people through apps and social media platforms for both of them. Um, this one distributed about 2,000 self-test kits and this one over 9,000 self-test kits. And they found a 5% positivity rate in this um, abstract and a 7% positivity rate in this abstract, substantially above the background rate of 0.2%. So they were actually enriching for a, a population at high risk. However, only 41% of these individuals were linked to care and started on ART and only 51% of the positives in this study had confirmatory tests were linked and started on ART. So what that suggests is that self-testing is helpful but that we need additional strategies uh, to link people who test positive to care. Okay, so let's turn to HIV prevention interventions. These were some really interesting data presented from the HPTN 083 study. And what you'll remember is that that was a study that compared um, cabotegravir long acting to TDF FTC, uh, or a once a day oral pill. So half of the people got a, an oral lead-in period of cabotegravir, followed by loading doses of cabotegravir um, at uh, weeks five and nine. And then every two months thereafter, they got injections of cabotegravir and they got a placebo pill, daily pill. The other group got an active daily pill of TDF-FTC and placebo cabotegravir. And we have 4.4 years of blinded study follow-up um, so they updated those numbers, and then they presented brand new one year of unblinded data. So these are the updated primary blinded data. They have presented at AIDS 2020 and at CROI 2021, um, and now they have 14 infections in the cabotegravir arm, 41 infections in the TDF-FTC arm, so a relative reduction of 66% in the um, risk of infection in the cabotegravir arm compared to the TDF-FTC arm, so it was shown to be superior. And then when we look at the one-year unblinded analysis period, you can see that there were 11 infections um, in the cabotegravir arm, 31 infections in the TDF-FTC arm, again, about a 67% reduction in the risk of new infections. And what is interesting is that this rate of infection was about one and a half times the rate of infection that was seen in the blinded period. So the infection rates actually went up in the unblinded period. And one of the questions was, so this is overall a 66% reduction in uh, new infections. But the question was, why did the infection rates go up? And there are two possible explanations. One is that the adherence went down. And so this is data from dried blood spots. Um, and if you look at both green combined, and that's the numbers at the top here, um, that's more than four pills uh, a week, which is considered to be uh, highest efficacy. Um, you can see that the seven, it went from 73% to 59% during the blinded period. So there was a drop off in adherence. And that was also shown if you measured it um, through, uh, through plasma levels. And you can also see that in the cabotegravir arm, there was also a reduction in the proportion who were covered, 91% uh, in the blinded period, but only 80% in the unblinded period. So some of the explanation may be because of uh, lower adherence during the unblinded phase. The other possibility is that the Latin American countries came on later in the study. So they accounted for only 32% of the data in the primary analysis, but they counted for 54% of the data in the unblinded analysis and the infection rates were higher in Latin America. So here were the conclusions from the study. The advantage of, of long acting cabotegravir for HIV prep in men who have sex with men and transgender women persists in magnitude being about 66% reduction in HIV incidence with an additional one year of follow-up that was unblinded. They increase the incidence, the increased incidence in both arms may be attributable to either this reduction in adherence and persistence or an increased contribution from high incidence regions and no new safety concerns were identified. They also reported that while CAB LA breakthrough infections remain rare, they are still unexplained and there were a total of seven cases 
of breakthrough despite on-time injections. So the rate is very low, but that was a false statement in the test question number two. Um, there were in fact breakthrough infections despite on-time uh, injections. So it's not 100% uh, efficacious. And then in the HPTN 083 in the sister trial in women, the o cisgender women in the 084 study, there's, um, they're testing an optional oral lead-in now. Uh, and then they're looking at uh, doing RNA testing as a screening assay. And I'm gonna show you why in the next slide. Um, this is a data also presented at the study from Sue Eshelman that went and did qualitative HIV RNA assays to determine if earlier infections could be detected. So they went back and tested um, specimens that had been uh, stored. They also did single genome sequencing data to see if they could find INSTE mutations even when people had low levels of RNA. And here's what they found. In their, the 16 um, breakthrough infections in the cabotegravir arm that they evaluated, detection was delayed in 11 of them. And an RNA assay would have detected infection in nine of the 11. So it wouldn't have detected all of the infections early, but it would have detected um, the majority of them, 82%. And seven out of 16 of them had INSTE mutations. So there were INSTE mutations seen in four of them. Screening with the RNA testing could have detected infection before a major INSTE mutation. And in two of them, it RNA testing could have prevented the accumulation of additional major INSTE mutations. And so the investigators concluded that the use of a sensitive RNA assay for HIV screening could detect infection um, and allow you to start ART earlier and avoid these INSTE resistance. Um, um, but when they were queried about what happens for people who aren't for sites that can't do RNA screening, they felt strongly that RNA screening should not be an impediment to using CabLA because of CabLA's high efficacy. And then these were some interesting data from HPTN 084, which was the sister trial in cisgender women in um, Sub-Saharan Africa. And the question here was, we have this comparison in the 083 and 084 study between cabotegravir long-acting and TDF-FTC, but what we don't know is how, did it, how would it have compared to a placebo? And so what they did was this counterfactual analysis where they took data from three other studies that were happening around the same time and were happening in many of the same countries and in some situations at some, some of the same sites that the 083, 084 study was being done in. And what they did is they calculated what was the placebo incidence in those studies. And if you had limited the CAB LA, the HPTN 084 study, to just those countries that participated in these other three efficacy trials, um, what would the efficacy have been if you had compared the uh, rate of infection in CAB LA arm versus the placebo arm in these other studies? And what you can see is that it was 93 to 95% efficacy and that it was pretty consistent across the, the three studies. So that would suggest that uh, long-acting cabotegravir is 93 to 95% efficacious compared to a placebo using this counterfactual analysis. And this may be a way to do analyses in the future where you can't do uh, placebo-controlled trials. What about cab LA safety in pregnant women? Um, well, they did have some pregnancies in uh, the HPTN084 study, and they did see more pregnancy-related adverse events, not more um, PrEP-related adverse events, but more uh, pregnancy-related adverse events in the CAB-LA arm than in the TDF-FTC arm, but all of them were judged to be unrelated to the study product. Then they also looked at pregnancy outcomes. Um, and they found no difference in pregnancy outcomes in women with CAB-LA compared to TDF-FTC. And they also found that there was no difference um, in the, the terminal half-life. So the age, weight, race, and pregnancy status were not significantly associated with the drug half-life. So that's good news that it should be equally efficacious, we hope, in uh, pregnant women. And I'm going to come back to why it's so important that we deal with uh, PrEP in pregnant women um, on the next slide, but let's first start with pregnancy and birth outcomes in TDF-FTC exposed women. 
And this was a study uh, called the PrEP in Pregnancy and Postpartum Study in South Africa, where pregnant women were offered HIV prevention counseling and PrEP through 12 months postpartum. And they compared pregnancy and birth outcomes in the PrEP exposed versus the unexposed uh, people. But 93% opted to take PrEP. And so most of the people were PrEP exposed. Those were shown in the orange bars and in the gray bars are the people who were PrEP unexposed. And what they saw was no difference in pregnancy outcomes shown on the left, things like miscarriage and stillbirth, or on the right, birth outcomes, things like preterm delivery and low birth weight. Um, there was no difference between people who had taken PrEP and people who hadn't taken PrEP. So that's good news on the safety of TDF-FTC PrEP for uh, pregnant women. The reason I wanted to come, uh, the, that I'm focusing on pregnancy in particular with PrEP is that um, pregnancy is a particularly susceptible time for young women. Um, there's an increased risk of HIV infection during pregnancy and 25% of all vertical transmissions, mother to child transmissions in sub-Saharan Africa occur in women who became infected during their pregnancy, not that they started uh, their pregnancy uh, living with HIV, but that they became infected during their pregnancy. Um, so this was a study in which over 300 women um, age 18 to 35 underwent safer conception counseling. 96% didn't know their partner's zero status and 60% of them decided to opt for PrEP. Um, that's good that the 60% had opted for PrEP, but this is among the people with PrEP. Um, did they take their pill as, a, uh, as measured by opening their electronic pill cap? Um, and if you look at their levels of plasma tenofovir, uh, at six months, it was only about a third who had high levels, and only at 12 months, only 14% had high levels. And yet this was a very high risk group. The incidence was exceptionally high, 3.66 in the people who had initiated PrEP, 4.6 in the people who hadn't initiated PrEP. So this was a, a population who really need uh, prevention strategies and we need to find better ways to support women to take PrEP during their uh, pregnancy. So I'm just gonna show you one slide on the Islatravir uh, study. This is data from the phase 2A study. Um, and Islatravir is a nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor that has several favorable features, including this long half-life um, and uh, is being evaluated as a once monthly oral tablet, as well as a subdermal implant um, that could be used once a year. Uh, they, gave women, they gave the participants in this study either 60 milligrams or 120 milligrams of uh, every month of Islatravir. And what you can see is that in terms of metabolic outcomes, the group that got the 120 milligrams did have a slight increase in weight of 1.8% and in peripheral trunk fat of 3%. But there was no difference uh, between in trunk fat, uh, peripheral fat, or weight in the 60 milligram dose, which is the dose that's being used in efficacy studies, and no difference in hip, spine, or bone mineral density for any group, and also no changes in creatinine or estimated GFR in any of the groups. So that was all the good news. The bad news is that right now the studies are on clinical hold because um, Islatravir has been found to be associated with a drop in lymphocyte count. And so all of the, the Islatravir prevention trials are currently on clinical hold with no one being uh, newly enrolled or randomized at this time. Everybody's off there as Latravir and they're just being followed for safety. So our hope is that this will get back on track in the future. So these are some data on the interaction of PrEP with gender affirming hormones and um, in both directions. So does PrEP affect gender affirming hormones and do gender affirming hormones affect PrEP? And so this was a relatively large study in transgender individuals, 114 people participated. 49 uh, transgender women were on stable estrogen and started PrEP. And what you can see is what happened to their estradiol levels is that they didn't change between baseline and week 12. Of the 39 transgender men on stable testosterone, there was a small, considered to be clinically insignificant decrease in testosterone levels between week zero and 12. So the good news is it does not appear that TDF-FTC prep um, interferes with uh, 
with gender affirming hormones. They also looked at the other question, looking at people not on hormone therapy versus those who were on hormone therapy and looking at their tenofovir levels um, in their blood, um, in their dried blood spots, and found there was no significant difference between those on hormone therapy and not on hormone therapy for either transgender women or transgender men. They also asked them about their body image satisfaction 24 weeks after they started PrEP and their satisfaction with their hormone therapy on gender transition. And there was no, uh, no change in, um, in either of those measures. So the good news is it does not appear that, that uh, PrEP interferes with gender affirming hormones or that gender affirming hormones interfere with PrEP. So this was a very interesting study looking at um, what do people choose, what do women choose if they have an option to take either the depivirine ring or oral prep. And what, what happened in this study was half of the women were randomized to get the depivirine ring first and then oral prep for the second six months. The other half were given oral prep for the first six months and then the depivirine ring for the second six months. So they, um, Everybody got an opportunity to take both. And then they had a choice period where they were op offered either oral prep or depivirine ring, or they could choose no product. And um, this was being done in South Africa, Uganda, and Zimbabwe. And what you'll see is that two thirds of the women opted for the vaginal ring, about a third, a little less than a third opted for oral prep, and only 2% opted for not taking either one. If you look at what their levels were like of um, either depivirine in the ring or tenofovir in the oral prep, you can see that um, the green shows high levels, the yellow shows um, some levels, and the red shows low or no study product. There were a few women, less than 5% of visits were categorized as no or low um, prep, but most of the women were actually able to use the product and the women who um, were do, who did well, who always uh, were in the green, were more likely it, for oral prep, were more likely to choose oral prep. So it was a kind of a test run for women um, to see whether or not they could take oral prep. And that group um, were the ones who were more likely to opt for oral prep at the end. There was another study presented on vaginal rings, this time tenofovir vaginal rings that were uh, intended to be used every three months. So the good thing about this is that tenofovir gel has actually been demonstrated to protect in one study, but not in some other studies. And the hypothesis was that that was due to low adherence. Uh, tenofovir also may have some activity against HSV2. Um, and the idea behind a three month ring is that it might help increase adherence and require less frequent visits to uh, clinics. So the, the vaginal ring, the tenofovir vaginal ring was found to be safe and on a 10 point scale from one to 10, most participants liked the ring, the average ranking was eight and not, the average ranking was nine about um, whether they would use the ring if it were found to be effective. But the challenge was that in some subset of the women from months two to three, the levels of tenofovir dropped um, pretty substantially. And it's not exactly clear why that is. They're looking into uh, questions about whether it might be related to the microbiome, um, but there's more formulation work that needs to be done with these three month rings. Um, I next wanted to highlight some uh, talk that Nika Seidman um, presented uh, in one of the symposia that I really highly recommend because it really talks to us about how we counsel about PrEP. And she was applying lessons on efficacy and autonomy from contraception, she's an OBGYN, to the issue of PrEP. And what she said is that one of the lessons to be learned is that there was this push for a period of time for a long acting reversible contraception or LARC um, to push that for women, particularly women who providers felt might be poorer candidates for adherence to other methods. And that had the unintended consequence of um, dissatisfaction with the methods, discontinuation, and negative impacts on future healthcare interactions. And she gave us some quotes from people who 
or even speculating patients who were speculating that maybe there was a contest going on um, behind the scenes and that's why they were being pushed into uh, getting and keeping IUDs. They actually did a study at an OBGYN conference where providers um, were shown videos of different individuals and asked what kind of method of contraception they would counsel the women to use. And providers recommended LARCs more frequently to poor women of color than to poor white women and more to poor white women than to middle-class women. And so there is this racism and classism that it influences who we presuppose is going to be able to um, adhere to our various agents. And young women were more likely to report providers expressed a preference about contraceptive methods and perceived provider preference was associated with decreased method satisfaction in another study. And in qualitative studies, young black and Hispanic women perceived subtle provider preferences that negatively affected their contraceptive use and their future interactions with providers. And Nika pointed out that I just showed you in the REACH study that even though uh, vaginal rings are less efficacious, that 67% of women opted for the vaginal rings. So that just shows that effectiveness is just one of the reasons why, why uh, people might cho choose uh, their form of contraception as well as their form of PrEP. And so she applied the sexual and reproductive justice lens to PrEP and particularly talked about eliminating barriers to access, describing what PrEP is and what it's not, making HIV prevention methods readily available to those who want them, but respecting the decisions of those who choose not to use PrEP or who discontinue PrEP, and to maintain a focus on what, whether an HIV prevention method meets that individual's needs rather than some public health goal. And she drew on uh, a presentation from another um, interactive session in which you know, it was just described that women may go on and off of PrEP, um, but that if we get that wrong, the journey can end abruptly. So I, I really recommend that um, talk and you can see that online. These are some data on trends in the PrEP continuum in the Latinx men who have sex with men in the United States from 2014 to 2020. And these data come from the American Men's Internet Survey and they had over 9,000 Latinx men who have sex with men. And what you can see is that the blue line is aware of PrEP and that went from 52% to 84%. But if you look at in 2020, only 30% had discussed PrEP with a provider. And only half of these used PrEP in the last 12 months. And current PrEP use has been very low and stable at 11 to 12%. So it's great that we're getting increased knowledge of PrEP, but if people, if providers aren't at least discussing PrEP and offering PrEP, then we're gonna be underutilizing PrEP. These were some data on use of navigators to link people to PrEP. And um, this came from three Thrive demonstration projects where they had 1,355 PrEP eligible men who have sex with men. And if the men use navigation, around half of them ended up getting linked to PrEP. Whereas among the 2,000 PrEP eligible men who didn't use navigation, only 3% used PrEP. So it shows the critical role that navigators may play in increasing access to PrEP. It was a 16-fold increase for all men who have sex with men, 18-fold for Black men who have sex with men, 8.8-fold increase for Latinx men who have sex with men, and a 19-fold increase for white men who have sex with men. So how do we get providers to talk to their patients about PrEP? Well, this was an interesting uh, study um, of 191 patients who'd had a positive STI result and their providers were randomized to either get an email message to the provider suggesting that they offer PrEP or a message through the electronic medical record or um, standard of care. And either message resulted in a 7% increase in uh, prescribing PrEP that's shown in the red. So not a huge bump. Um, and their next plan is to actually see if they uh, message the patients directly to get them to talk to their providers about PrEP. So um, lastly, in terms of the uh, HIV interventions, I wanted to talk about vaccines. 
Um, there was data presented from the Imbocoto study, which is a phase 2B vaccine efficacy study. Uh, it used an AD26 backbone um, that's the same backbone that's used in the J&J &J COVID vaccine. Um, and it uses, a, it's a mosaic vaccine that includes information from, from HIV from around the world. So it should potentially be a global vaccine. Um, with a trimeric envelope protein. And you can see that it was the vaccine was administered at four time points, um, month zero, month three, month six, and month 12. And unfortunately, um, the vaccine efficacy overall was only 25%. Um, and that was not statistically significant. So you can see here in the placebo arm, the infection rate was actually over 4% per year and in the vaccine arm, 3.6% per year. Um, so very high infection rates, again, in young women aged 18 to 35, and just showing that we need, we desperately need strong prevention strategies for that population of women. This was a um, study that took place in five Sub-Saharan African countries. So another um, talk that I'd really highly recommend is Mark Feinberg gave a talk on um, HIV vaccines. One of the things that he did to begin with was to describe why has it been so hard to get to an HIV vaccine when we got to a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine so read readily, um, so quickly. And what he described is that the, there are some real substantial differences between HIV and SARS-CoV-2, that HIV has enormous diversity and establishes a persistent infection compared to SARS-CoV-2 that has more limited diversity and causes only an acute infection. That there's a high level of glycosylation. So there are these sugar, it's sugar-coated on the outside of HIV um, that structurally shields the neutralizing envelopes. Um, and as opposed to there's um, more limited glycosylation of the spike protein and neutralizing epitopes are readily accessible to antibodies on the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, and Neutralizing antibodies are not readily elicited in natural infection and to date not by vaccination for HIV, whereas neutralizing antibodies are readily elicited by infection and vaccination against SARS-CoV-2. He then went on to discuss the way in which we previously have approached vaccine efficacy studies and where we're heading now. And, um, in the past, what we've done is we've tested different vaccine candidates with the hope that one would become uh, efficacious and then we could work backwards and find what the immune correlate of protection was. But now um, the idea is let's start with what we think is an important immune correlate of protection like neutralizing antibodies and work backwards and see if we can actually create the neutralizing antibodies using the vaccines. And so that's really a big thrust right now of the HIV vaccine field is trying to use vaccines to generate neutralizing antibodies. And so again, I highly recommend Mark Feinberg's plenary talk. So let's turn now to talking about COVID. Um, this was a plenary session by Muge Sevic uh, in which uh, she presented the rates of COVID um, that were happening in 2022. And you can see that particularly uh, at the beginning of 2022, there was this Omicron surge, particularly in Europe and in the Americas. Um, at that time that she reported, there were 408 million cases and over 5.8 million deaths. And you know that we're now over 6 million deaths. One of the interesting things that she pointed out was that um, these are data on the proportion of everyone over the age of 60 by the number of doses of vaccine that they've received in Denmark, England, Portugal, and the US. And she was asking, why do we have a different pandemic in the US than we do in Western Europe? And she said that the main difference lies in outcome of vaccine coverage. This red bar shows no vaccines. And you can see that that's extended much more substantially in, um, in the United States than it has been in these other countries. And that the main difference in outcomes lies in vaccine coverage. So that these are the number of hospitalizations that vaccines could have averted in the over 60 
year age group compared to the hospitalization rate that we would have expected had we matched Denmark's vaccine coverage. She also uh, talked about asymptomatic infection. Um, and there are a number of methodologic reasons that it's difficult to both track what proportion of HIV infections are truly asymptomatic and how infectious are those individuals. But here's the, the bottom line. 20% of people with SARS-CoV-2 infection, she estimated, remained asymptomatic during follow-up. So during the entire period of follow-up, 20% will remain asymptomatic. And asymptomatic individuals are less infectious than symptomatic individuals, having a reduction of about 65% um, less infectious than symptomatic individuals. She also pointed out the differences in vaccine uptake in different parts of the world. So these are in high income countries, upper middle income countries, low middle income countries and low income countries. And the darkest blue is fully vaccinated with a booster. The next blue is fully vaccinated without a booster. This is partially vaccinated and the gray is unvaccinated. And you can see that as you move from high income countries to low income countries, um, there's much less vaccination going on, such that the booster doses in high income countries are actually substantially higher than the total number of doses in low income countries. So next we're gonna to turn to talking a little bit about HIV and COVID. Um, so this was data on a national registry looking at clinical outcomes in people with versus without HIV hospitalized in Sweden. And so they use this nationwide register and they looked at all hospitalizations for COVID from February of 2020 through August of 2021. And they defined severe COVID as admission to an ICU or death within 90 days. They had 121 people with HIV um, who were hospitalized for COVID and, only 60, and about 65,000 people without HIV who were hospitalized um, with COVID. And um, the people living with HIV, however, were very well controlled. 93% had undetectable RNAs and their median CD4 count was 560. So you can see here that HIV status was not associated with an increased risk of severe COVID. It, the, the hazard, relative hazard or odds ratio was actually one. Unlike, for instance, people who had at least one comorbidity that had a fourfold increase in likelihood of developing severe COVID, meaning an admission to the ICU or death. So what that suggests is that HIV status is not associated with an increased risk of severe COVID, but that's true for patients with viral suppression. It may not hold for other populations of people living with HIV who are not well controlled. So let's talk about COVID-19 vaccines and vaccination in people living with HIV. So what, this was an interesting presentation looking at data from the Reprieve trial, which is this prospective randomized placebo control trial of a statin for preventing cardiovascular events in people with HIV. And it's a global study. So they're actually able to look at what were the rates of uh, vaccination globally. And here's what they found. The, the, People in high income countries got their vaccines much earlier than people in Latin America, South, South Asia. Southeast and East Asia have gradually actually overtaken these other countries. And Sub-Saharan Africa has the lowest rate of vaccination of all of these regions of the world in people living with HIV. Um, there are these racial and ethnic disparities so that white individuals, this is among all participants, white individuals had the highest rate of um, vaccination, followed by Asian individuals that, again, gradually overtook the other group uh, as we've seen that increase uh, in South Asia um, in uh, vaccination, and Black individuals uh, had the lowest rate of vaccination. And that Disparities were true in high income countries, but they were lesser disparities than, for instance, if you looked at Latin America and the Caribbean, where there were much more substantial uh, uh, disparities in rates of vaccination. Men were more likely to be vaccinated than women. People with a higher BMI were more likely to be vaccinated than people with a lower BMI. And people who had been on 
ART for a longer period of time were more likely to have been vaccinated than people who uh, had been on ART for a shorter period of time. So um, this was actually a very interesting study uh, called Sasanke, which means together, which was this safety and real world effectiveness of this of the J&J &J vaccine, COVID vaccine uh, in South African healthcare workers. They vaccinated nearly half a million healthcare workers and nearly 40,000 of them were people living with HIV. So this is probably the largest study we have of people living with HIV who have been vaccinated. Um, there was a homologous boost given four to six months later in about half of the participants. Only 2.6% reported adverse events after a single dose and only 0.9% after the booster dose. There were two cases of thrombocytopenic thrombosis seen in this study and four cases of Guillain-Barre syndrome. This was the effectiveness of the vaccine. It was 67% eff eff uh, effective against hospitalization, 75% uh, effective against hospitalization requiring critical care or intensive care, and 83% effective against death. Um, the effectiveness was maintained for people living with HIV against hospitalization, but not against death. So it was only 65% effective for people living with HIV against death, as opposed to 83% um, in uh, the overall study. So poorer outcomes for people living with HIV in, this, in that study. And then this was a study looking at booster doses and how effective they were um, in people with versus without immune dysfunction. So they considered people with immune dysfunction, people who had had an HIV, had had HIV, a solid or bone marrow transplant, autoimmune disease or cancer. And you can see that um, they were, the booster doses were given uh, the booster doses were recommended around this time, and there were there was a lot of Omicron during the period of time uh, post booster. So that's what they're showing here. Um, the outcomes in patients without immune dysfunction, the breakthrough um, was breakthrough infections were 52% to 77% reduced in people with boosters uh, if they didn't have immune dysfunction whereas it was lower, 39 to 60% in people without with immune dysfunction. The rate of hospitalization was also, uh, the protection against hospitalization was higher for patients without immune dysfunction than for patients with immune dysfunction, although still pretty high for patients with immune dysfunction. The same was true of invasive ventilation, also somewhat lower for patients with immune dysfunction. Um, and the rates of death, however, were pretty comparable between the two. So again, some diminution of the effectiveness of booster doses in patients with immune dysfunction. And that is the presentation. So let's come back to the post-test questions and ask you again, after black men and Latinx men, who's most at risk of becoming HIV infected in the United States? Is it white men, Asian men, native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander men or black women? Go ahead and vote. Okay, 97% of you got it right. It was black women. Um, so again, we need better prevention strategies, particularly for, um, for Latinx and black men and black women, although we need them for all populations. So uh, lifetime risk in black women is one in 75 compared with the lifetime risk in white men of one in 171. And which of the following statements about Cab LA is false? In the first year of unblinded data, it was still shown to be about 66% more effective than TDF-FTC at preventing HIV. There have been no cases of breakthrough infections in the participants who got their injections on time. Some people with breakthrough infections developed INST resistance or RNA re testing is recommended at baseline in every two months. 
okay. 81% of you got it right. There actually have been cases of breakthrough infections in people who got on-time injections. There have been seven of those uh, reported to date. Okay, so um, seven have been reported to date. Um, so now we'll, uh, just a reminder to submit your questions using the Q&A button. I will stop sharing and we can go on to the Q&A section. Great, Susan, thank you so much for that review. Really important data. Um, lots of questions have been generated, so I'm gonna jump in. One of them feeds right off your second knowledge question. So what caused those seven men on 083 who had on-time cab ejections to seroconvert? What do we know? We don't know. We just don't know. Um, what we are presuming is that it may have to do with compartmentalization of the drug in the tissue instead of in the blood, because it looked like those individuals had sufficient levels of cab LA in, or cab tegravir in their blood. Um, but we really don't understand what the reason is for those breakthrough infections. Um, it's just not known at this point. Is there var variability in cabotegravir PK pharmacokinetics among individuals that perhaps could explain it in terms of say rectal deposition or we don't know? We, we don't really know. Um, we, and we, the, this study didn't, didn't sample rectal tissue. So we don't know for this study in particular, what the, what the levels were like in the, in the rectal tissue in those individuals. Okay, sobering, although the number yes. as you pointed out is it's very small. small. Yeah. Okay, uh, lots of questions about the concept that we should be using an HIV RNA test yes. to monitor people on PrEP. Yes. So are we really going to do this? Is this what current recommendations are saying? So CDC is saying that for both oral PrEP and for TDA and for cabotegravir PrEP. Um, FDA, as part of the licensure, did say RNA testing should be used. What CDC has said, though, um, in, uh, in other venues is that they recommend using the most sensitive test that you have available. So they recommend using an RNA test if you have it available. Um, the most sensitive RNA test if you have it available. But I think that there's a general consensus that you don't want to not give PrEP because you don't have RNA available. Um, and obviously for oral PrEP, there's you know, some question about whether or not you really need to be doing RNA testing for oral PrEP as, as your screening uh, test. And so I think that the standard of care for most people is still to just use an antigen antibody test. And then um, jumping off from there, people asked, should we be using a quantitative viral load test or the qualitative viral load test? So what, uh, what is recommended is that it is the qualitative RNA test, um, which is more sensitive and has been licensed for use for diagnostics. Um, but again, not everyone has access to a qualitative RNA test. So if you don't, then a quantitative RNA test um, will also do. And is the frequency of testing and someone on PrEP the same as it has been recommended to be? Every, yes, it's still recommended to be every three months um, for oral PrEP and every two months for cabotegravir. Now, what is said is that for cabotegravir that you should be getting an, a test before you give each cabotegravir injection. But I think that that's also not necessarily easy to administer. If you had to get an RNA test, for instance, before each injection, you'd have to have two visits for every, uh, for every injection visit. And so I think, again, what people will be doing is screening probably using a point of care test um, at the time that they administer cab LA. And then if they have the opportunity, they can do an RNA test at a, simultaneous with the injection. And then an obvious follow-up question to that is, what's the cost? And is this a cost-effective strategy that's being rolled out? Yeah, it's not clear that it's a cost-effective strategy, uh, particularly for oral prep. Um, it's, well, for either of them, it's, it's gonna be quite costly to be able to do this. Um, part of what CDC has said is that they put it into their recommendation so that in part insurance would also cover the cost um, if it's part of a recommendation. But it also puts people in a, an awkward position if they 
can't or don't want to get an, uh, an RNA test. Uh, and the recommendation is that you, that you do get an RNA test. So I think it puts people in an awkward position and it's not clear that it's cost effective. I haven't seen any cost effective data uh, presented on this. Okay, makes perfect sense. <laughs> um, a couple of questions about the acquired integrase inhibitor resistance yes. on A3. Was that uh, thought to be acquired because of exposure to the drug or was this transmitted resistance? It was thought to be, most of it was thought to be acquired. They saw um, previous, so in four of the cases, they saw uh, infection without INST mutations. And then after time, because people had stayed on cabotegravir without going on to treatment because it hadn't been picked up because they didn't have a sensitive enough test, then the INSTE mutations developed. There were two cases in which the first um, specimen that they had had the INSTE mutations. What they don't know is was whether that was transmitted or acquired, um, but they did uh, go on to develop more INSTE mutations. And so in two of the cases, again, um, they could have actually, uh, more sensitive testing could have prevented additional instant mutations from developing. Mm -hmm. um, a question about when are you actually protected? What's the timing of protection after you get a dose of IMCAB? I have asked that question as well. And I think nobody really knows the answer to that. Um, they, there's some speculation that it might be seven days um, based on the PK, but nobody really knows. And uh, I, I asked CDC that question as well. And they've said, you know, we, we don't have a stand on that. We don't know. So I think it's difficult because we need to be able to counsel people, um, particularly in the direct to inject, how long does it take before you're protected? And uh, the best answer we have is probably seven days. And then the corollary to that is, would it make sense if you're transitioning someone from oral prep to injectable that you actually continue the oral for some period of time? Yeah, um, that's not clear. Um, it, it may be that it would be. I, I think the other challenge is that there were a number of infections that occurred when, when people were on oral cabotegravir. And so there are some people that are actually questioning whether you should be using uh, tenofovir FTC um, as, uh, as a lead-in, for instance, for the first seven days when you go direct to inject rather than oral cabotegravir, because we don't really have efficacy data on oral cabotegravir as an, as an agent. And there were some breakthrough infections in people on oral cab. Interesting, yes. <laughs> um, a couple questions about the PrEP navigation study. What are the yeah. strategies behind PrEP navigation? Well, PrEP navigation is probably a really important component. Um, what the PrEP navigators do is they often um, get people linked into care, but they help them with their insurance and issues around cost as well as access to care. And so um, these were based in these Thrive demonstration projects that were based in CBOs. And so the, the, um, the, the navigators were actually able to both help people get access to care, but also help them with their insurance and coverage uh, of, of PrEP. So it's really case management approach? It is a kind of case management approach, but with a, a heavy component of financial management as well. Great. A uh, question about the REACH preference study among yes. women. Yes. Uh, were the women um, informed about the efficacy data for both oral prep and the rings prior to them being given the choice? Yes, I believe they were um, as part of the uh, the part of the study, as part of the counseling around uh, around the, the the agents. It's just that I think, and we've seen this now in many many studies um, out of sub-Saharan Africa, that it may be difficult for women to take oral pills um, and. Part of the reason for the oral prep being challenging is that there's a lot of stigma associated, and so um, it may be difficult for them to store, or you know, they they may not be out to their parents. There was one study that I've seen um, that suggested that women who disclosed to their parents that they were on prep 
were more likely to be adherent to, to uh, oral PrEP. And so again, there are lots of reasons why women may not want to hold on to pills and take a daily pill. Uh, jumping back for a second, could you comment on the lead-in period required or not now for cabotegravir going with oral leading into IM injections? Yeah, that's great. Um, so the, the recommendation is still for uh, an oral lead-in period because that's what was studied. But what we know from treatment trials, and I think what we are going to be getting data from 083 and 084, HPTN 083 and 084, where they're going to give a direct to inject uh, option, is that most people when given the option are opting for direct to inject. And I think that that's really going to be the way that it's administered. And again, in part, we have to think about the vulnerability of that first month of oral pills. If you're giving Cab LA, because this is a group of people who may prefer not to be taking an oral pill, but you're making them take an, you know, an oral pill for the first month, that may not be optimal. And in fact, weren't there a few infections on 083 in the oral lead-in period? There were. That's right. Yeah. Now the FDA apparently has just approved that you can go direct to inject yeah. um, with either treatment or prevention based on some preliminary data. Right. And yeah. so have there been safety concerns with, with the direct to inject? No, in fact, there, there really were no safe. That was the, that was the reason for, uh, for the oral lead in and there were no safety considerations in the 083 or 084 study. So that's reassuring. So they yes. didn't see um, an idiosyncratic hepatitis or rashes or allergic reactions. They didn't uh, see any of that. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, big disappointment about Islatravir. What's yes. the mechanism for the lymphopenia? We don't know. We don't know what's going on with it. Um, they, uh, the company is investigating as rapidly as they can. Um, to try to understand what the mechanism is and to see it, if it's dose related, um, because there is a lower dose that's being used in the efficacy studies, but um, we'll have more data as it becomes available. It's not yet available. And it, interestingly, it wasn't associated with either anemia or thrombocytopenia. No, or it, was, anemia, no right? it was just lymphocytes. Yeah. So what an unusual drug toxicity. Yeah. I, it's, uh, it's tough to fathom. And then do, do we really think this can be overcome? Uh, this drug has, or compound has such promise for HIV prevention and treatment for that matter. It does have promise. I think one of the possibilities is that you could use an even lower dose that even with the 60 milligrams that you, you given on a monthly basis, you probably have at least a month of, um, of uh, forgiveness. Uh, in terms of taking your next dose. So if you were to able to cut down the dose even greater, because it does appear that there may be a dose response kind of issue with the lymphocyte count, that if you could give a lower dose that maybe it would uh, not have the same issue with the lymphocyte counts. And they saw lowered lymphocytes, not only in HIV, people living with HIV, but people who were not living with HIV in the PrEP studies. That's right, except that it, it was not a clinically, it, they didn't drop to a clinically significant level, um, but there was a drop in, in some people. Interesting and yeah. frustrating and yeah. confusing. Yeah, yeah. And it, it is such a promising uh, agent. So we hope that it will be able to come back online. Okay, uh, we're close to the end, but there's a few questions about the COVID study. So I'm going to finish up with those. The first is, is there a relationship in people living with HIV who are on ART or maybe specific antiviral therapy and the risk of acquiring COVID? Is there any relationship between those two things? I don't think we know that still, um, whether there's an increased susceptibility to COVID. There are some data that suggests that for people who have a low CD4 count or who are not virally suppressed, that there may be more severe disease. Now that was not seen in the, in the Swedish study that I uh, presented, but that was a very well controlled population. And there were data from a WHO study of 24 countries that suggested that if you had a low CD4 count or a high viral load, that you might be more likely to have poorer outcomes with COVID. And Susan, I don't think this was covered at the meeting, but any specific 
antiretroviral drugs that may reduce the risk of COVID. Early there actually, on well, there was one study presented at the meeting that suggested that tenofovir related, um, that TDF uh, in particular um, related, uh, people who were on TDF were less likely to acquire HIV. But I think the, the question still remains, is that because they were uh, better controlled in terms of their HIV? or was it uh, actually related to the drug? They did compare it to an abacavir-based regimen and found that it was, that they were significantly less likely to, to acquire HIV. Yeah, interesting results. I think there's some prospective studies still in progress. Yes. Okay, last two questions. Why are there disparities in COVID vaccination in people over the age of 60 between the US and Europe? I wish I could answer that uh, well. I mean, we know that there's a lot of vaccine hesitancy and that it's true for certain parts of the country more than other parts of the country and in certain demographics more than other demographics. But particularly the people over the age of 60, you would hope that the vaccination rates would be very high because the risk of adverse events from COVID are so high. Um, but we, they just have much higher vaccination rates, probably less um, vaccine hesitancy in the countries that I showed. Okay, and then last question. Um, someone who's received J and J and received a first booster with J and J, what's the preferred second booster? We just heard about second boosters this week. Yeah, should it be J and J or should they switch to an mRNA vaccine? My personal opinion is they should switch to an mRNA vaccine. Um, and the reason that it comes from a, a switch study, just looking at the second dose, uh, looking at uh, booster doses. This, um, so it wasn't looking at a third dose, it was looking at a second dose for J&J, &J, but it looked like a heterologous boost was um, a better, uh, you got more of an antibody response, but that's based on, again, no data on the third dose. Susan, that's great. Thank you for uh, a really interesting presentation and thanks for uh, a wealth of answers to all the questions that we posed to you. Uh, this afternoon or evening, depending on where you are, <laughs> or morning, I guess. It's morning in California. Yes. Okay, I think we're okay. ready to wrap up. Jose, Great. back to you. Thank you, Dr. Buckbinder and Dr. Gulick, for a very thorough discussion. As a reminder to our audience, evaluations and how to claim continuing education credits will be emailed by 5 p.m. Pacific time tomorrow, and this will enable us to review all of those that have attended today's live broadcast. Here are a list of our upcoming webinars. Our next webinar is scheduled for April, and that will be on cardiovascular complications in people with HIV. Here are our upcoming courses. Next week, we have our conference. I mean, um, our, our course, the ISUSA 30th Annual Update on HIV Management in T Atlanta, Georgia. And lastly, uh, we have a COVID-19 dialogue scheduled for tomorrow. If you have not yet registered, we highly encourage you to join this discussion. We'd like to thank our presenter again, Dr. Buckbinder, and to our moderator, Dr. Kulik, and to the audience for your participation. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you.